Today, it's going to be a little bit packed. We have a lot to cover. Uh, we have demonetization, exit, and this. Um, so demonetization and uh, uh, the meta challenges are in this year's survey. You know, exit is in last year's survey, and I would urge um, all of you to, to read that because this is, these are chapters which I think have been um, well received and also these I think are uh, express some new ideas about the Indian economy that uh, you know, we were very excited to do. Now, <clears throat> I, I'm going to begin with demonetization because I think what is really important about this and this is what we did in the survey was to see you know, how do you A, analyze this completely unprecedented action? I mean, what data should you use? How should you uh, analyze it? And also, how do you teach this? So I think demonetization, because it was for us a kind of great learning and opportunity, I think you should see it both as a learning, but of course more as a teaching opportunity. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let's start uh, demonetization. I mean, obviously the place to start is, uh, is this. देश को भ्रष्टाचार और काले धन रूपी दिमक से मुक्त कराने के लिए एक और सख्त कदम उठाना जरूरी हो गया है आज मध्य रात्रि यानी 8 नवंबर 2016 की रात्रि को 12 बजे से वर्तमान में जारी 500 रुपए और 1000 रुपए के करेंसी नोट लीगल टेंडर नहीं रहेंगे यानी ये मुद्राएं कानूनन अमान्य होगी रियली ड्रामेटिक एंड हाई यू नो पावर्ड अनाउंसमेंट आई मीन इट इट कैन बी डिलीवर्ड बाय नो मोर इंपॉर्टेंट पर्सन सो ऑन द 8th ऑफ नवंबर uh, India decided to, or the government of India decided to, uh, you know, make uh, the 500,000 rupee note, they ceased to be legal tender, except for a few purposes. And uh, roughly 86% uh, of cash in circulation, and the total cash at that time was 17.7 .7 lakh crores, was rendered invalid. So the first thing we did in the survey was that, you know, if you know, we made some assumptions and said, if all this goes through, what would be, uh, you know, what would happen to a cash in circulation, a currency with the public, and what would it be historically? So straight away, you can see that this is probably a fairly, you know, dramatic, unprecedented action because it tells you that the growth uh, in currency probably, um, you know, would, was never would never be as low as it would be after demonetization. And of course, it would also be a sharp decline. Although what you see here is that if you look at it historically, there have been other episodes of sharper declines as well. But in terms of the level of growth, this is probably among. So straight away, I think what, um, uh, you know, if I were uh, teaching this thing, I would immediately ask your students and say, um, what happened in these other episodes? What happened? And, and how do you compare it with this episode would be something that uh, you would... Uh, so fairly unprecedented. The other thing which is very interesting about this is that, remember in history there have been demonetizations. And so in the appendix to the, ch to the chapter, we compiled all the demonetize... Um, well, not all, as many as we could get data on, but you broadly find two patterns to demonetization. One, you get sudden demonetizations, but all of them have been in the context of some kind of social or political or economic upheaval. You know, it could be uh, in the context of hyperinflation, it could be in the context of political change, it could be in the context of war. Then on the other hand, we've had slow and gradual demonetizations. Many countries have done, you know, phased out you know, Singapore, Europe phased out its 5,000 euro coin. Many, many countries have done it, but they've done it gradually. So you've had sudden demonetizations uh, uh, along with upheaval, 
gradual demonetizations, but the Indian experiment was unique. It's the only sudden demonetization in very normal circumstances. There was no hyperinflation, no war, no conflict, nothing. And so that was what was in some sense historically uh, quite special about the Indian demonetization. Now, um, so of course there were cash shortages for some time. Uh, um, um, so what were the objectives? I think the Prime Minister, when he read it out, he said explicitly there were four objectives, you know, to prevent the curb of black money, corruption, currency counterfeiting, and of course, high denomination notes being used for terrorist activities. But I think in some ways, uh, I would argue that uh, underlying all this, or maybe going beyond this, what I think demonetization was, was it was meant to signal a regime shift in terms of how much the government would tolerate you know, illicit activities and activities that did led to tax non-compliance. So think of demonetization as signaling a regime shift over and above all these uh, specific uh, activities uh, or objectives that the government was trying to achieve. Now, uh, uh, black money, of course, was supposed to be rendered useless. Now, you have to ask, what is black money? And I think we often get uh, confused by this. I think there are many, many ways of, of uh, splicing this. Black money, you can distinguish between, you know, uh, origin, its nature, and, you know, the function that money performs. So money performs transactions function and a store of value function. And in each of these, you can get white money or black money. So, for example, a company pays employee salary in cash. It's declared to the authorities. It's white money. But the same thing if an enterprise pays in cash, but they don't declare it to the authorities, then it becomes black. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, of course, is that uh, transactions can inherently be, uh, you know, supposing you had, uh, you know, one more column and said money laundering, by definition, that would be black money. So you can have um, black money from illicit transactions, smuggling, uh, counterfeiting, etc. But you can also have um, black money created by transactions that are legal, but then it doesn't lead to tax compliance. Uh, so, so that similarly, store of value, you know, when households keep declared savings in cash for emergency, that's white. But then if a businessman holds undeclared cash, say he wants to use it for election time, that's, that's black money. So uh, distinguish between, you know, what the transaction is for, what the origin is, what the nature is, and whether it's an in, uh, inherently illicit transaction or it's a completely legal transaction which is then declared or, or undeclared. What is the background to this? Uh, the background to this is first you look at cash to GDP around the world. And this is a chart which shows, you know, cash to GDP on the y-axis, a country's per capita GDP on the x-axis. And you do find that India is relatively high. Uh, its cash to GDP was around 12, 12 and a half percent. And you can see it's at the upper end of the chart. And certainly for countries at comparable levels of development in the middle of the pack, India is quite high. So, so there is a sense in which India's cash to GDP ratio, there was a lot of cash in the economy. Then you find this is some private data. Uh, uh, what percentage of consumer transactions are carried out in cash? And India is amongst the highest in the world, both in terms of volume and value. This is a Price Waterhouse study. The interesting thing, of course, is that also the cash to GDP ratio in India has been rising. It's really interesting that, you know, in the first 20, 30 years after independence, the cash to GDP declined. Uh, but what you find, this is, Blue's real GDP growth. This is cash as a percentage of nominal GDP. You find that cash to GDP has been steadily rising. And then this is a, an interesting period. This was the high inflation period. So when inflation was high, a cash uh, came down. But once inflation was kind of conquered again, we're back to a rising cash to GDP. So essentially, the long-term trend is that we have a, a high and rising cash to GDP ratio over time. And within that, you see that uh, the high denomination notes, HDN, that's 500 and 1,000, 
Of course, they will vary over time. It, it, at different periods of time, the high denomination notes may be different, but you see high denomination notes becoming a higher share of nominal GDP. So both cash is increasing, but high denomination notes are also increasing. And this is a comparison of the highest denomination note as a share of GDP per capita of the country, which tries to estimate, so, you know, if uh, the, the high denomination note is very high relative to GDP per capita, then it's less likely that it's being used for transaction, more likely that it's being used for store of value. And India somewhere here is in the middle, middle of the pack. So you can't really make out whether uh, India is using, I mean, it's predominantly be using for transaction or for store, storing value. So what, I mean, in the survey, uh, you know, many, many people have come out with estimates of black money. Uh, there, were, there were three reports submitted to the government some time ago. Um, uh, you have to distinguish between how much, what percentage of the economy is black. That's one set of questions. The other set of questions is how much of the uh, money in circulation was actually uh, being used, not being used for transactions purposes and was being stored kind of, you know, maybe illegally. And, and you can make these assumptions based on, you know, how quickly the note deteriorates. You know, for example, I think we replace our uh, 10 rupee notes, whatever, every three years because they deteriorate very rapidly. So uh, the Reserve Bank actually has data on all these denominations, how rapidly they deteriorate. They call the soil rates. So uh, you can use, make assumptions on, you know, how much do you think the 500 and, uh, and 1000 should deteriorate relative to the 10 and 50 and 100 and you can come up with a, a assumption, a, a estimates of uh, what black money should be. One assumption yielded 7.3 lakh crores. In the survey, we revised some assumptions. It's something that if you want to know more about in greater detail, you can contact us. On another assumption, one estimate was that it was 3 lakh crores or about 2% of GDP. Now, so now we get into the broader analytics of demonetization. What was demonetization all about? I think that uh, I'm going to show you a table, but there's one thing for those who, who study monetary economics should uh, and teach macro and monetary economics should keep in mind, which is something very, very uh, unique uh, about uh, uh, the Indian demonetization, is that, you see, you think basically what happens is that the supply of money has basically come down in, in one shot. But the interesting thing is something that I also learned as, as I went along. You see, remember when you think about money, uh, cash is money, the deposit you put in the bank is also money. So, uh, uh, so has all money come down because of demonetization? No, in this case what happened was that one particular form of money which is cash came down and the interesting thing is that, look, so, so if you look at growth in average currency uh, and uh, total money, this is total money. But what you see is that this is a very unusual experiment in which cash came down dramatically and intrinsic to this, not separate, because this came down, this went up dramatically because this cash had to be deposited in the bank. So this is a very, it's not like, you know, a, a money contraction like has happened in the past. It's a lot like money expansion like all the central banks have done in the, in the recent past. It is a particular form of money change where one form of money declines very rapidly and another form increases very rapidly. So in, in the survey, uh, you know, we call this the helicopter hoover because, you know, helicopter uh, drop was what when happens when you put money into circulation. But if you suck out money, we called it, I mean, just as an aside. But this is a very unusual. So straight away for all of you who are thinking about money and the impact of money on the economy, you have to then see, oh, if this has happened, then a lot is going to depend upon how substitutable cash and other forms of money are in transactions. So this is a very important point. So it's not all money has come down, one form of money has come down, 
to the extent that you know you can substitute away from that using other forms of money then maybe the impact will be less if you can substitute less then the impact will be more so it's a very unusual kind of um, monetary shock uh, uh, or experiment as it were it's also a tax on unaccounted private wealth maintained in the form of cash so essentially people who had black money uh, and, and kept it in 500,000 uh, would lose some of it if it was black money. But if they laundered it, in any case, uh, they would have to pay taxes on it because they would have to uh, you know, show, declare how they got it. And this is the process that is uh, ongoing now. And of course, it's also tax on savings outside the formal financial system. So you could think of demonetization as forcing people to cover illicit savings into financial savings as well. So these are all uh, uh, aspects of demonetization. And so we have, you know, th there's a, a table in the, uh, in the survey which goes through each of the, you know, impossible impacts in the short run, in the long run. And, you know, you could, you could think about many, many things, for example. Interest rates, for example, I'll show you a chart. Because deposits increased into the banking system, interest rates came down. How they will recover depends upon how much money comes back. Um, you know, um, uh, formalization, digitalization, I'll show you, uh, will probably go up in the long run. Wealth uh, depends upon whether uh, people can launder it or not launder it. Real estate, given that a lot of money is in real estate, should those prices decline. I'm going to show you what we did on GDP. And also we think that tax collections will actually go up over time because more of the economy is going to be formalized. Uh, and so we had two, three months of high frequency data. Uh, did in fact uh, digital transactions go up? And we categorized it into three. The digitally excluded, who basically th do digital transactions through Aadhaar. Uh, then there are the more affluent people who have credit cards and debit cards. And then we have less affluent cus uh, customers who use rupee cards, what mm. happened to them. So again here, uh, uh, it's less important whether it went up or went down, but to think about how you should think up even about digitalization. Because digitalization, there are at least three categories of people who can be, you know, uh, are I mean, digital haves and have nots and digital kind of intermediates. Some who don't have phones at all, they would be digital have nots. You know, some who have, you know, iPhones, smartphones, they will be affluent customers. And others who may not have uh, smartphones, but who may still have regular phones or who may have, you know, rupee debit cards. So we had, uh, we analyzed what happened to all kinds of digital transactions. So here's, here's how, here's how to think we thought about what the short term macroeconomic impact is going to be. Remember that one of the things that the survey had to do was to assess the short term macroeconomic impact. And so conceptually, again, thinking like macroeconomists and monetary economists, how should you think about demonetization? One, it's an aggregate demand shock, primarily, because it reduces the supply of money and private wealth. Remember, private wealth can be reduced in three ways. Just to summarize the questions, private wealth can be reduced in three ways. One, it doesn't come back into the system, they've lost it. Two, they've laundered it, but they paid a price to launder it, right? For example, if you want your, you know, all your drivers, you know, you had one lakh, you want to distribute amongst five drivers. If the drivers were smart, they would say, we'll do it. But commission chahiye humko, commission chahiye, and that's the and that's the loss to the owner. And the third is when the wealth comes in, you have to pay taxes on it. So, aggregate demand shock that reduces the supply of money and private wealth. It's an aggregate supply shock also, to the extent that cash is an input to production. For example, this happened during the sowing season, and if you have to pay cash to laborers to thing, then presumably it could have an impact. If you can't pay cash, you can't hire labor, you can't have output. So it's also an aggregate supply shock. And of course, it's also an uncertainty shock. We don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how uh, you know, policy is going to respond. You don't know, uh, you know so, so there's a lot of uncertainty, both for investors and consumers, which could affect their spending decisions. Now, 
One thing we said very clearly in the survey, and the last point that's getting hidden, is that in all this, the impact on the informal sector would be very difficult to measure because we don't actually have data. You may have data on bits and pieces on the informal sector, but getting an impact on the informal sector on a macroeconomic basis. I mean, you could say in Tirupur this happened, in Surat this happened, but what happened at an all India level on the rural, uh, on the informal sector is, was very difficult, continues to be very difficult because we don't have data on this. Now, so what are the indicators we looked at? Again, please go ahead and update it. We looked at, for example, what happened to agricultural sowing? Was that affected? What happened to indirect taxes? Because remember, we thought, some people thought that activity would come down and taxes would slow down. But what happened was, to some extent, people, part of laundering involved having to declare it and having to pay more taxes. So to some extent, so you don't know which effect outweighs which effect. Then we monitored, for example, one informal proxy for the informal sector demand was you know, the two-wheeler sales. Two-wheeler sales came down very sharply. So that was an indication that maybe, you know, labor uh, uh, informal sector demand had come down. And then, of course, we monitored real credit growth, what was happening to the economy. And of course, these, these are just some indicators. You could monitor a, a lot of indicators to see what was happening. But this was what we did in terms of seeing the sh very, very short-run impact of the monetization because between November and January, we had about two to two and a half months of data and that's what we had to do. But then we also had to come up with a GDP forecast for, uh, for the, for the um, economy as a whole. And there, of course, again, this is very simple uh, and very crude, but here I'm going to drop names here. So as we were doing this uh, you know, exercise of how do you, how do you um, estimate the impact. You know, you could do it in very sophisticated ways. You could do it in simple ways. So essentially what we did was we said, look, MV equals PY, simple quantity theory of money. Um, what we're going to do is that to estimate the impact of P on P and Y, we're going to see what's going to happen to M. We're going to make some assumptions about V, and then we are going to figure out what PY is going to be. Remember I said, Cash and money, how will it behave? I mean, if cash comes down, deposit goes up, is it the sum that matters? Or no, because they're not fully substitutable, actually, uh, individually they matter. So you need a separate analysis of the two. And of course, you have to make assumptions about the formal and informal economy. Because in principle, again, analytically, to be sharp and stark, essentially you could think of, you know, if you have a formal economy and an informal economy, the informal economy will be affected by this, and the formal economy in principle should not be because it doesn't depend on cash, it's mostly credit and so on, or other forms of money. So how do you, you know, bring these two in? So we had to make some assumptions about, you know, first, what would be the reduction in M? Second, what part of the economy fraction was formal, how much was informal, and how this would work itself through that equation MV equals PY. Now, here's the first difficulty. What is M? How do we project M? Because remember, this something very interesting was happening, right? When uh, it, demonetization happened, first, some of some transactions were still legal, even with the old notes, like paying taxes, paying for petroleum, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to take that into account. The second thing was that a lot of the new money that was coming in was 2,000 rupee notes that were less liquid. You know, people wanted a hundreds and five hundreds, not two thousands. And you, you, you could, under, you could, you heard a lot of reports about you know two thirds not being as liquid as say the five hundred or the thousand used to be because you know people said no, no, nobody's accepting. And remember, in all of this, so much of money is about trust. You know. I take a 2,000 from you if I trust you. Uh, I won't take a 2,000 from you if I don't trust you. Or if I believe, you know, it's going to be very difficult for me in turn to change that to pay for the smaller transactions that I have. So we had to make a lot of assumptions about this. 
And we also had to make assumptions about how much digitalization would take place because V, the velocity of money, the circulation of money, is also going to be affected by that. So uh, lots of assumptions went in. And remember, my, my theory of, of economic analysis is be bold, make the assumption, but be transparent. Most people would say, oh my god, I cannot estimate this, I cannot estimate this, this is very difficult, it's very difficult, therefore I will make no assumption. Or often they will make, they will make estimates where they do make assumptions, but don't, are full, not fully transparent about them. So we made assumptions, we said these are our assumptions, and for example we said, this would be the uh, remonetization timeline uh, based on, I mean this is the impact so, so one of the things we showed, for example, was based on our analysis, the currency squeeze was actually greater in December than in November, even though, uh, you know, even though much more money had come into circulation in December because of the liquidity impact that 2000s were not as liquid as something else. So, and so then we made these assumptions, and these were the assumptions that, uh, you know, and again, uh, I, I'm not saying, uh, again, please go back and tell your students, uh, you know, show this to them, and compare it with actuals. I think these are going to be very different from actuals. So tell them, and remember we put, uh, uh, this is, the red line is our central estimate, and because there's a lot of uncertainty around this, we said you need confidence bands around that, i.e. we're not sure, I mean, we think, we suspect this, but it could go down as much as here, it could go as much as here, because inherently there's a lot of uncertainty in these estimates. So be bold, be transparent, be cautious, uh, and, and go ahead and, uh, and do these things. <coughs> Excel spreadsheet, yeah, we can, we can give you the Excel spreadsheet for this. And then we made these real GDP forecasts. Now I'm certainly not going to show this to my Kerala friends. They'll say, but actually GDP is this and not this, but you should go. And, and we were off, our GDP estimate was off, and you should go and, 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 uh, and, and go. No, no, actually it was close actually, was it? No, it was off. So we also uh, said, you know, a, a, there would be a lot of excess liquidity. This chart, red line, is about excess liquidity, so how much more deposits there are in the system than what actually banks want, and you find that even after seven months, we haven't cleared away the excess liquidity, and one of the monetary consequences of that has been that if you look at short-term rates in the system, what they call the call rate, which is the overnight rate, and the seven-day repo rate, the 91-day treasury bill rate, they're all still either at or below uh, the, the repo rate, which they should not be. In normal times, the call rate should be equal to the repo rate, and the treasury bill rate should be about 25 basis points higher than the repo rate, but we still have a lot of excess liquidity uh, as a consequence of demonetization. And this is continuing to have macroeconomic effects. Uh, I'm showing this to you again because these have macro consequences. And, and this. so, now, <clears throat> one of the things we also uh, um, said was, look, we said there are going to be short-term costs, um, and some of which we can't measure because we don't measure the informal economy, but there could be some long-term benefits. And we said that in this case, these long-term benefits are not just nebulous, oh, it is going to, you know, there will be benefit, but we can actually tell you what the markers, what all of you should be monitoring to see if uh, demonetization is delivering these benefits or not. And we said that there are at least three markers, you know, things, targets that you can monitor. One. Are we going to see increased digitalization on a consistent basis? Uh, uh, and that's something that we have to monitor. And all of you are uh, clearly monitoring it already. You're monitoring it on a daily basis, which is fantastic. Um, second is, if the aim was there was too much cash in the system, you must get a reduction in cash in the long run, because after all, if some of it was black, then there should be less of it. So there should be a reduction in cash to GDP ratio, an increase in formal as opposed to informal savings. You should see that. And the last thing we said, of course, was that because, as I said, this is about signaling that there's going to should be, uh, that, the, that, the, that the government would be less tolerant about tax non-compliance, we said that over time you should see an increase in uh, the number of taxpayers and the tax income. Now, remember, 
and, and this is you know, uh, completely, we said that, that then, we say it now, that when you talk about you know, the markers of success, there are targets, but there's also timing. I mean, how soon should these benefits become evident? Clearly, these are not things that's going to, that are going to happen overnight. I mean, digitalization, you have to see this increasing on a consistent basis. Yeah, yeah cash to GDP, again, on a long-term basis. Number of income taxpayers, you can't just see a blip one year, and if it settles back into the old pattern, then you haven't achieved it. So uh, two years from now, three years from now, I will come to you, uh, to your classrooms, and see whether you've done this analysis or not. I will be sitting in the audience, you will be delivering this, and I will be saying, but you have made data, but you haven't done it. Why haven't you done it? I will demand of all of you. But, but this is something that you should do. Or, I mean, this is, these are the markers for success. There's a target. There's also time, time frame for when these things can happen. And that's what we should. Uh, so that's how we should, you know, in the medium term. For example, I think uh, putting together another idea, someone, uh, someone remarked, and I just want to make it public, this is perfect to do all kinds of difference and difference analysis. Exactly. You can say, oh, so. We think that, um, of, for example, you can see, just to give you one example, right? What happened to, did the increase in income tax payers this year, how did it compare with increase in income tax payers last year between November and before November? So you can do all kinds of interesting analysis to see what the impact's going to be. And I can guarantee you over the next three to five years, there are going to be many, many PhDs done, uh, hopefully in India, but I know certainly around the world, on, on the impact of demonetization, because I think it's going to be a very rich subject. Then we also said in this, you know, <clears throat> after all, some actions, how do you maximize the benefits and minimize the costs? And I think that we, we uh, said a number of things that we should do. Uh, for example, one of the things that I was uh, kind of very keen on that is that we should bring land and real estate into the GST, uh, and, and I think we should also uh, you know, in, uh, try and increase the income tax, uh, reduce maybe the corporate tax rate, and also there's a big concern that uh, demonetization might lead to a, a raid raj, you know, going after taxpayers, and we have to be careful that while we you know, try and you know, pursue cases where we think uh, you know, there is black money involved, we should also be careful that it doesn't become a free-for-all trawling exercise where the tax department goes and, you know, goes after uh, every all and sundry because that can have a very chilling effect on the economy that can also create a lot of harassment for taxpayers and therefore we should uh, avoid all of this. So, uh, to conclude, uh, a very bold and unprecedented experiment. It was a kind of uh, a, a, a partly a monetary experiment, but partly also a kind of signaling uh, device. Um, uh, it raised a whole lot of analytical issues in terms of how we should understand it and how we should analyze it. And, you know, sure, we've presented uh, uh, what we did in the survey in terms of how we should measure the impact in the short run, in the long run, and trying to put all of this together. What should be the impact on, on GDP? And, and this is what we did. And um, I think that really this is a terrific, terrific uh, 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 experiment for, for, for teaching and learning. I think it's really, you know, for example, to explain how money works. Now, now just to give you, so, so to give you just one example, when you when you look when we saw the first um, uh, agricultural sowing data that came out after this, uh, remember we said that if it's an aggregate supply shock, then to the extent that you need cash, you may see some decline in agricultural uh, production. But we didn't see that, and so so clearly what was happening was that you know maybe informally credit was being extended, given instead of cash, and so. You know, so the Indian economy was finding, you know, kind of jugad type mechanisms, ways of getting around this, and, and so these are so these are all things that I think one should look at, analyze, and study in greater detail in the years to come. Now, questions. It is. I have basically read this that GST would be a kind of follow up 
for the demonetization. So my question is that, uh, as we know that in Indian economy, most of the black money is being owed in the form of real estate. So, um, and in uh, GST, this particular aspect is out of the purview of GST. So how would GST be a follow-up for, for demonetization of real estate? See, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you should have been in the GST along with me. Then there have been two people shouting for land and real estate and, and not just one. Um, but, but here's the thing, right? GST, um, how, how is GST a follow-up to demonetization? Right? I would say uh, one uh, very important and successful, and one precisely because of what you said, not as successful. Uh, successful because, remember, with GST, by definition, I spoke about, remember, all the invoice matching that's going to have. You're going to be able to cr you know, identify you know, undisclosed, both indirect tax, but also the information that you get will allow you to track direct taxes as well. So it, there's evidence around the world that you know, in, when VAT systems increase, uh, income tax collections could also potentially increase because you get the data. You know, if a company is importing you know, 10 BMWs and then in the owners don't declare that in their uh, income tax returns, you can actually do these you know, data analytics. So in that sense, it is a natural follow-up to demonetization. The follow-up would have been even better if uh, land and real estate had fully come into GST. Now, let's, to be, so it's disappointing that it fully didn't come into GST, but one aspect of it has come into GST, which is what are called works contract. I.e., if you go and get someone to build your house, that tran those transactions will now be in GST. What will not be in GST is if you buy ready-made property, it won't be under GST, and land transactions per se, if you buy land, those would not be under GST. But my hope is that over time, because unlike uh, alcohol, this is not constitutionally out of the GST. At any point in time, you know, the GST council could. And in fact, you know, after I wrote that piece uh, on bringing land and real estate, uh, the GST council, some at least uh, one or two of the members raised it and you know, brought it up very strongly. And, and the finance minister said, you know, uh, uh, this is something that we should be looking at uh, over time. So I'm, I'm, I'm still, I've not given up hope on, on, on that aspect as well. Kind of uh, simple question. Yeah. This, in this My MB, friend, no question is too simple as yes, you know. All, all MB, good questions. MB is equal to PY. Huh. Uh, you are using this to forecast real GDP. Okay. The real GDP slide is based on this MB is equal to PY. Okay, so that's a really good question. That's a very good question. Um, and I'm glad you asked it. Because in principle, in principle, we can only uh, um, uh, forecast P times Y, not Y. And because it's a monetary shock, it's going to have the first impact on nominal GDP, not real GDP. So again, the other set of, so we forecast nominal GDP, and then we made some assumption about how much will be price uh, based on underlying trends and how much would be quantity. Because you would think, you would think that you know, uh, nominal GDP would come down, so both prices and quantities would come down. So whatever little I understand about demonetization, uh, one thing sticks out. Uh, replacing notes is fine. You want to curb black money and uh, solve a host of other issues. Why a 2,000 rupee note, which is as, I mean, in terms of transactions value for the most part of the population, exactly. very, very illiquid. So okay, okay. I, at my <laughs> level, I had a problem converting. So I can very well imagine the problems that uh, other people uh, much below us in income see, status. Yeah, but see, so uh, any uh, thoughts? Uh, why the 2,000 denomination? That's all. Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, why 2,000 when you're demonetizing even the 1,000? Uh, I, I think that's a great question. I think there are two components uh, to uh, one I, I can answer, and one I, I will, you know, you will have to, uh, you know, future research will have to do this. But essentially, that, see, the 2,000, even the 2,000 was quite illiquid in the early stages, but when the smaller denomination notes started coming, it became more liquid. You see, this, so this tells you that money is about a lot about confidence and trust. So if you feel that there's a lot of 500 in the system, you're willing to use more than 2,000. 
You see, because you say, well, I know I can use it because if I don't, uh, if I want a smaller note, I can always get it. But if there are no 500 notes, so the same 2,000 note at one point of time, and the 2,000 has very different liquidity properties because of what else is happening, and those are the kinds of assumptions we had to make. Now, why it was introduced when the 1,000 was, uh, was, was seen to be you know, a source of black money. I think there could be political economy. There could have been the thing that, you know, we had to, you know, because to print uh, smaller notes takes longer time than 2000. So that could have been one, one reason. Uh, and also, you know, uh, because see also that uh, <coughs> before, uh, uh, two or three years before all of this, the RBI had also recommended uh, a 2000 and a 5000 note. So they must have had some logic for that. Mm -hmm.